My name is Doreen Morin Van Dam, and I am your um, moderator today. Thank you for coming to be with us to discuss the art and science of facilitation, uh, the virtual book tour stop number one with. Um, Team Catapult faculty, we're so excited that you're all here live with us. And before I say anything else, I want to remind you and tell you that for those of you who stay to the end, uh, we are giving away two books, signed copies of the book. So you got to stay to the end. So just want to throw that out there right now. So thank you so much for being here. I see lots of people from all over the world here. So let me start off by introducing the author. Uh, Marsha Acker is here today with us. Hi, Marsha. Hello, Doreen. <laughs> A lot of you that are watching, I know are familiar with who Marsha is, but if there's some people here who don't know exactly who she is and what she's accomplished. Let me just give you a really small <laughs> little bit of information on Marsha. So she's a professional facilitator, executive and team coach. She is the founder and CEO of Team Catapult and she uses system uh, thinking, structural dynamics, dialogue and agility to help teams collaborate and align with clarity, purpose, and vision. So Marsha, you have put together a fantastic team. Um, <laughs> so your faculty is here today and I'm excited to introduce them next. So uh, we, we are so grateful that you are here. We have uh, actually uh, people from different parts of the world on faculty. So let me get started and um, introduce our faculty to everybody. And once again, Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here live. Just want to remind you, stay to the end and uh, get a chance of winning that signed copy by Marsha. So we're going to start with introducing um, Antoinette um, Kutsia. She uh, is an ex-software developer that took a detour through academia to end up in the world of coaching. Her focus is growing agility in leaders across the organization. She is a coach of agile coaches and develops coaching and the facilitation skills in both the team and enterprise level internationally. Welcome, Antoinette. All right, next up we have um, David Levine. Uh, he's an experienced enterprise agile coach and trainer. Uh, for David, the agile way of working began as a project management director at a software company. It was after working in a large insurance company that he realized that the work he had been doing was called agile. Welcome, David. <laughs> so glad you're here too. Um, next up, we have Jack, uh, Jeff Hackert. Uh, he is a coach and mentor to leaders at every level, helping teams to improve their approach to product development and software delivery. Jeff helps teams align on organizational goals, build shared values and work habits, and to improve both their communication and software delivery process. Welcome, Jeff. Glad you're here. Um, next up, I want to introduce you to Carrie McLeod. Um, she brings her wit, her smarts, and love of connection to her work with individuals, teams, and organizations. She fosters pervasive leadership, builds learning communities, and invites agility perspective and practices in a diverse range of organizations. She's an associate certified coach with the International Coaching Federation. Uh, welcome, Carrie. All right, um, we next up is Larissa Caruso. Uh, she has been working with Agile and facilitation since the beginning of her career. In the past seven years, a lot of her work has been in the video game industry, supporting improvements at the operational, strategic, and organizational levels. All of that was done with the use of Agile through mindset, methods, facilitation, and coaching. Welcome, Larissa. All right, and last but not least, I wanna welcome William Strydon. Uh, he is a professional coach working in the Agile space. He's currently focusing on leadership and Agile coaching. He enjoys helping organizations and teams making the transition to Agile and gaining agility in their organizations and teams as a result. Welcome, William. <laughs> so you might have noticed that we have uh, one open spot. Uh, we're missing uh, Kay Harper, who could not be with us today. Just want to acknowledge that she's part of the team and she was not able to make it. So welcome, everybody. 
Yes, I'm excited <laughs> to be here. So yeah. thanks for coming. Yeah. So um, uh, while everybody is getting um, themselves unmuted, hopefully, um, let me give you um, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you have questions for the panel, um, please put them not in the chat, but in the um, Q&A. That would be really helpful. Um, at the end of our conversation together, um, where we're going to talk stories of facilitation, um, I will um, pose some of the questions to our panelists. So if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A. We'd love to hear it. Um, if you have technical issues, um, you can uh, private chat Trish, who's on here, a support. Um, that would be great. And um, for that, I just want to remind you once again to stay stay till the end. This conversation um, hopefully will be very inspiring. I am truly excited to learn more. So uh, we're here to celebrate, right? We're here to celebrate a book, uh, The Art and Science of Facilitation. So what is the book? If you haven't seen it yet or haven't read it yet, haven't had a chance to, um, let me just read you exactly what this book is about. Uh, it's a guide to moving your team further forward using the groundbreaking five guiding principles of the facilitation stance. You will learn to lean teams toward effective collaboration by inviting different points of view, even when it creates conflict, Remaining unbiased in high stakes meetings, understanding what the group needs and navigating difficult interpersonal dynamics. So Marsha, um, I'm just gonna throw an extra question out there. What yeah. made you write this book? Uh, well, I, somebody earlier today, I was talking with someone and they asked me um, a similar question. I, I think the book has had various titles and um, kind of various um, scope for a good 20 years. Um, I think I first had the impulse to do it. It was early 1999, 2000. Um, flash forward to a, a fairly long journey, which if anybody wants to talk about offline, I'm happy to share. But um, uh, it came down to the last several years, uh, just being really passionate about how we communicate with one another and that conversation is important. And I think that when we can do it and when we can have conversations in the workplace, certainly around agility, um, individuals and interactions over processes and tools, I think that uh, organizations and relationships can, can propel forward. And I'm, I'm passionate about bringing that skill to sort of leaders at all levels of an organization so that it's not just set aside for a select group of people or um, certain people outside an organization to come in and do it externally. So. Awesome, thank you. Well, we are very grateful that you did. And as somebody who doesn't really work in the agile space, um, I really am enjoying the book. So thank you. So I'm going to start off with a very easy question for everybody on the panel. So the question is, give us one word to describe the book. Who would like to go first? Okay, David, go ahead. I think this book is essential. Ooh. I think this book is something that every person who leads meetings and wants to bring people together should have sitting right over here or here, but certainly very close. <laughs> All right. Um, I think this book is spicy. <laughs> <laughs> I just love how it's always talking about with conflicts in it. So very good. I'll go. Uh, so I think it's multifaceted. Um, it's not only um, about how, what you can do, although there's lots of that in there. It's about how you should be. Um, and it's also, also about how you can grow. And it looks at you as um, the biggest tool in, as a facilitator, you know, in your facility. You are the biggest tool in your own facilitation toolkit. Jeff, do you have an answer? Yeah, uh, indispensable. <clears throat> I just can't, uh, I really cannot uh, overemphasize what a treasure this is. It's like 20 years of experience really boiled down into uh, essential 
and easy to understand components, I think it's going to have a huge, huge impact on people's leadership, ability to support their teams. Yeah, indispensable. William? Yeah, for me, the word essence comes up. Um, it is kind of how will you show up in the room? Um, and like Antoinette was saying, it's like it lies within each of us. Uh, and this book kind of highlights that. And to me, it brings out that what is the essentials and essence about it. Excellent. Carrie. Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll break the rule of one word and give two, of course. Um, my, my words are Sherpa plus. So picking what everybody has already said, and it's it's a guide and more, right? It's getting at who you are, uh, even more than what you're doing, and so it's more than a guide. And and um, I agree with David; it it needs to be front and center, or just off to the side. Excellent. Well, that's why we are here, right? To talk about the book and talk about facilitation and to share today our stories of facilitation, especially you as staff at Team Catapult, the experience that you have um, being facilitation of uh, facilitators and uh, being able to share some of, um, you know, working together and working um, on your own and how, how you've used that and the wisdom that you have. Um, and then of course, how the lessons in the book, how we can um, all continue to grow. So as we are here to celebrate um, the art and science of facilitation, and I think um, Patty has a link for anybody that um, hasn't seen the website yet. Um, we're excited that you're here. So we assume that if you're here with us live that you have come to the website and clicked on the tour page and that you have um, indeed registered to come here. But if you wanna go back and take a quick peek at the website there um, and uh, look at the book and what's there. Uh, let us know at some point if you've read the book. We, um, Marsha, would love to have to know what you think. Uh, just like uh, we just kind of shared our words um, and what we think of the book, we would love to hear yours as well. Um, so um, I'm going to ask the panelists next. Is there a favorite story, a favorite chapter, a favorite passage? Um, something that Marsha wrote that touched you, that, that helped you, that um, shook something loose? Um, I would love to know uh, what that is, if you have something that you want to share that um, just kind of bubbled up maybe. I'm happy to go. I, uh, the section on neutrality, um, I just find to be... Uh, uh, it's a continual reminder. Um, when I first met Marsha uh, and uh, we started working together, I had no concept that that was a, an expectation for the role of leader or facilitator. Qu quite the opposite. Um, I felt very strongly that my role was to push, poke, uh, prod, uh, and essentially move things in a particular direction. Um, and so this section in the book, uh, it's in the maybe the first 50, 60 pages, uh, just such a vivid reminder of how differently I approach the world and, and the change that's possible. So I'm sure there'll be lots of opportunity to talk more about that, but uh, yeah, it's very powerful. Thanks yeah, and, and Jeff, I wanna build on what you're saying. I think there's so much in the book and that's the section that stands out for me as well. I think, um, I don't know what other faculty members experiences, but it's also the big huh that we get when we're lead, when we're co-leading our workshops, when we introduce it, um, like in the ways that you you describe Jeff, but but it's it's a conundrum for people, I think. And and what I really see over our workshops, and I'm I'm anticipating will happen for readers of this book, is it's a real invitation. To, to park our own bias and our own opinions and lean into the power of neutrality. And Marcia just mm -hmm. writes about it so beautifully in that, in mm -hmm. that first, first chapter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, a, there's an echo of that in the, in the piece that I, um, that I really enjoyed um, and 
a piece that created distinctions for me that I didn't have before um, between, you know, three different kinds of agendas, you know, the kind of the, the agenda or the purpose that we walk into, into a meeting, then the emergent one and the developmental one is the third one. So, uh, you know, I just love that story. You know, I chuckled at your story, Marsha, um, about, um, because I could relate um, about also, you know, when it just so happens that your own personal agenda, you know, is echoed by their agenda um, and you kind of forget that actually if that agenda changes, you need to let go of the one that you have. Um, that you've acquired in the meantime, you know, I really chuckled. So love the, you know, the, the distinction between what we walk in with, what happens inside, and also what happens over the over the long term um, in terms of agenda. So thank you. I, thank you, Antoinette. Uh, David, I saw you nodding your head uh, when Carrie was talking. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, um, I, I just wrote down, um, uh, that another way you could cast large sections of this book is it's a how-to um, to be a genius at managing conflict. That so much of what um, we facilitators walk into are people who feel passionately about important things and um, having a way through that. And the passage actually that I wrote down, it was a short passage. Um, and it's uh, let individual voices dictate your curiosity and not your decisions. And um, I read that and, um, and I set the book aside and then I came back to it and I read it again and I wrote it down because um, so much of it, of this book is about giving us the tools and the development path to, um, you know, we all know about Shuhari uh, as an agile concept, but here's a place where you can, um, you can have that path. You can, you can get to there and, and the concepts become, um, they, they, they start out at, um, and to, to Carrie's point with that, oh my goodness, that, um, you know, Jeff, uh, we've, we've all had that experience, right? Of, you know, we're experts and, um, right? And, but we don't really understand what that, what that gives us license to be in this kind of a context. Um, and then it takes you through to a point where at some point you're, you realize that you're, you're reading um, these ideas that were introduced early in the book in a very um, introductory kind of way. Um, you're, you're hearing them in a very advanced way. And it's a very natural progression. So it's, it's very, really very exciting. Thank and you. just to build on what David just said, because uh, the, the, the thing that stuck the most for me in the book is a, it's even highlighted saying, remember, you're not the process and the process is not you. And the whole uh, uh, part of the book is talking about, you know, inviting opposition and, and how you deal with conflict. And the inviting opposition is something that uh, Marsha did beautiful, does beautifully in her career and did beautifully in the book, talking about that. Uh, because a lot of times, even I had this bias where I felt that conflict in a meeting meant that I was a poor facilitation facilitator or there was something bad about the process that I was doing. And the way that she brings in the, it in the book, it's just like, no, it's the system. Like, look at the system, look at what is happening there. And then don't uh, judge yourself by the process. Don't think that you're the process um, and invite it in, right? Because as, as, as Antoinette said about the three agendas, there's more to it than uh, uh, what you're seeing in there. So that invitation to be curious and explore and not see it as like something you did or something that you didn't plan well or whatever it is, it's very powerful in the book because it takes away the weight that we all put in ourselves, that self-talk that we put in our heads um, and talks more about how to massively uh, apply this, focusing on the other, it's about them, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to build further on that, um, the passage for me that, that stood out, don't worry, I'm only gonna quote about two or three pages, so just hang with me. Yeah. Um, from memory. Uh, yeah, it's the one where, where Marcia says, as a facilitator, 
you have to find your own source of courage. Mm -hmm. Courage to say what you see, to inquire about the difficult subjects, and not to walk past the elephant in the room. Because for me, that kind of highlights the work that we as facilitators already there to do. And then to differentiate between that capital A agenda versus the small capital or lowercase uh, agenda and what's really there in the room. What do we need to work on? And that's the real work of facilitation. Um, but of course, it's easier said than done. And the book helps you to grow to that point. So, and I'm going to leave it at that for now and hand it back over to Doreen. All right. Well, thank you, Marcia. I'm going to ask you the question is, I know you wrote this book, but is there a special thing that you or special passage or special story or something that you uh, want to highlight that you want to share that you want to make sure that people don't miss when they pick up your book? Well, there's, um, hmm. <laughs> that's a hard question. I, I don't, I, there are lots of passages. I'm, I'll read one in a minute that's, yeah. that, the, that actually Antoinette was just referring to um, because it's, it's a story uh, and lot, it was loads of learning for me. But one of the things that was coming up for me um, off of David and Larissa, what you both were saying, and it's this concept that we, to be in a room where there's conflict means, and I held this along, I, I have held this many times, which was, I, I think the first story was I've screwed up. Um, and then the second story was I'm, I'm getting it wrong. Uh, and this is not how it was supposed to go. And um, Jeff, you and I have had an experience of being in a, in a oh, yeah. room uh, with a, we were in a, it was a private class. So it, you, you hear the culture in an organization a lot mm -hmm. in private classes, as everybody on this uh, panel knows. Um, but there was a really strong belief that was coming forward, which was uh, uh, the phrase kept coming up, when the meeting goes off the rails, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And I think it was only through the, a, a day or so into it, we finally began to realize, ah, here off the rails means conflict has come in. Mm -hmm. and. And so the, the story and the, in the new facilitator mind is, how do I make that go away? Um, and I think it's, it's natural to be there, but I also think it's really helpful to reframe your relationship with conflict and to, I mean, I used to wanna, I wish the, I wish the floor would um, open up and I could go through it when conflict mm -hmm. emerged. <laughs> I, f I spent lots of time designing sessions uh, to minimize uh, conflict and minimize the amount of time people could talk to one another in a large open space. So I, I get that. And I think that, <laughs> boy, do we need people who can help us um, uh, talk about differences and actually surface the difference and work with the difference rather than manage it out of the room. So. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Um, I want to remind those of you who are here watching live that um, there's already a couple of questions in the Q&A. So if you have questions for panelists um, to go ahead and, and put them in there as well. I'm going to move on to the next question um, that is for all the panelists. Uh, if you want to answer, that would be great. Is there anything that you can share about your own learning journey with Agile, especially as it pertains to facilitation? Something that um, somebody who might not have read the book, who is watching, who um, might be interested in facilitation, maybe they're in the agile space, but maybe they're not. Um, something that you can share about your own journey and learning. We'd love to know. Well, yeah, just to touch back on what we were talking about earlier, um, <clears throat> I think my approach to leadership and so my approach to facilitate like it was a um, my sort of ad hoc approach to leading meetings was to drive uh, a particular agenda maybe it's my agenda maybe it's a, an agenda of leadership or some somewhere outside of that room um, and yeah this is a sort of and and then adjudicating uh, conflict usually that uh, that was like you know sort of splitting splitting the baby or trying to figure out who the good is and who mm -hmm. the bad is. Um, and I think like probably everyone, uh, I became really conflict averse. Um, some, someone else asked a question I, I noticed just why is, why is this book important today given like the raft of communication books that are out there? 
and and I would say for this this reason in particular, um, Marsha provides a framework uh, that allows you to look at uh, communication at both a uh, context level and a content level, um, and really emphasizes for the facilitator to pay uh, real attention to the context, to the acts of speech that are happening in the room. That shift, um, I, first of all, prior to meeting Marsha, I had no idea it was even possible. Um, second of all, I wouldn't have known what to do with it <laughs> if I had read about it. So most of the things that I've read around <laughs> communication uh, really were playing into other skills that, that actually weren't getting the job done. I mean, they helped, uh, don't get me wrong, but, but I still have this default disposition that my job is to adjudicate when there is um, sort of point counterpoint kinds of conflict. My job is to corral everybody into a particular decision shape. Um, and then if anything goes wrong, if there's any like major conflict or disturbance in the room, I have done something wrong and it will probably reflect negatively on me. Uh, and so the reason I think that it's, this book is so important now and, and back to this experience is that Marsha really flipped my, um, my approach on its head. Uh, it was very visceral. I, I, we probably don't have time to tell the story, but basically there was like open revolt and I had, I had to walk through it um, using some of the tools, many of the tools that are in the book. Uh, but I was like, it, I was like a day one noob. It was not easy. Um, but Marsha was so, so patient through that process. And I really got to see um, how taking myself out of that role allowed a team to, uh, first of all, communicate effectively with themselves. So it was easy to see how my behavior influenced the behavior and communication of a team and how removing myself from that, removing my agenda, uh, really opened it up. Uh, and then number two, it, it, it allowed for the insight that we have this assembled host of really smart people, people we've worked so hard to get into this room, right? We create a culture, we set like, you know, pay and other differentials, try, trying to distinguish ourselves to bring these people in. And then my default behavior as a manager was to stifle their communication. Right, right. It's bananas. <laughs> and there's hardly, I haven't read a single book that's like, hey, you're doing this, except this one. Thank you, Jeff. That's that's hey, that Sorry. really wonderful. No, wonderful learning, learning journey. Appreciate you sharing that. Um, with us and, and with those who are here with us live watching this. Uh, really appreciate that. That is uh, very insightful, I think, for all of us and uh, makes me want to, uh, you know, finish the book, <laughs> get to all the good parts, right? Um, anybody else um, have a personal learning journey that they, they want to share? Uh, I would, if, if I sure. could. And, and it's that... Um... There's this incredible value to be derived from running meetings well. Um, and in, on my journey, it was um, discovering in a very um, uh, antiseptic, analytical way that requirements in a large PMO at a large company were taking way too long and adapting these materials that for this approach um, interviewing product owners, facilitating meetings where all the constituents were there and producing great value um, through this. And a lot of the value came from what people who were passionate about technical approaches to things and how things should work and so on. And that kind of shows up as conflict. But it re really is, is people who are really interested and really committed and really want to do a great job. So oh, some of this is, is recasting that, um, um, that notion of conflict into something else. And, and, and again, using that, um, that those individual voices as data um, and as, uh, as something useful. There's a, just one other nugget, which I, I learned over and over again, which was that when you let all the voices emerge from a group, it, I've seen it happen so many times where there are five, 10, 15, 20 people, 30 people in a room and one voice 
that might have otherwise not ever have been heard will turn the conversation in another way and make for something different and often prevent a mistake or create a breakthrough. That's wonderful. Well, that's a great lead in to the next question, unless somebody else wants to um, chime in on this one. Um, if not, maybe, I'll, go maybe, ahead. Maybe what I'll just say is, uh, so Marsha, what you've done quite masterfully in the book is, um, is capture that growth that we go through um, when we start out as agile, um, you know, whether it's a scrum master or a team lead, brand new and facilitation is something that means you send out the agenda and you book the room and maybe you've done a little plan if it's a retrospective of the five steps. Um, and then you start realizing as you go through that, that there's more that I need to do and I'm not quite sure what it is, but this isn't working. And then you figure out there's a little bit more and you put that into place and then there's even more and there's even more. So what really I wish I had your book when I started out, you know, 10 plus years ago, facilitating, um, because I really the more I learn about facilitation, the more I think everything is about facilitation in collaborative environments. So. And just to add one thing for what Antoinette just said, right? I wish I had the book like four years ago and even uh, later in my career because the one thing that really stuck to me and the, in the book is that uh, she says, uh, go fast, uh, go slow to go fast, right? And I remember that a lot of times um, I would be like, yeah, I know I've prepared, I've done all the things that I have to do for this meeting. And I would uh, not, I would refuse to do a certain threshold of work more than I thought the meeting was worth. Uh, but it was a pure like inward judgment. I wouldn't sometimes talk to people, to stakeholders and get their perspectives and understand what they were expecting. And so a lot of times what would happen is I would get into the meeting and then I would just start hearing people saying like, well, we don't have the right people in the meeting or, uh, um, well, we, we should have done this at prep work. We, we are wasting time if we're doing this in the meeting. We should be doing this other thing in the meeting. So I heard a lot of things and I never quite understood until I started like being more, you know, in the shoes of those people. And what I think that uh, the book does is take you straight away to the shoes of those people to be like, you know, look at their perspective too. Look at what you're missing out when you're not hearing all the voices, when you're not talking to them, when you're not uh, interviewing them uh, beforehand. So that just helps you understand why certain things are important that sometimes you know they're important, but it's kind of like, I'm not gonna do this because I don't have time or whatever it is. So it just helps explaining a lot of the whys too. Awesome. Well, I'm going to ask Marsha now to, we're going to move into um, uh, stories and Marsha um, has a place in the book, a story she would like to read to us from her book. And um, then I'll, uh, after that, I would love for panelists who um, have special stories that they want to share as well, uh, because we understand that you are on both sides of the aisle, right? You are the facilitators, but you've already uh, been in the meetings as participants. So um, I'm sure you have interesting stories of, of, of triumph um, and also um, of difficulty. So um, Marsha, I'm going to give the floor to you right now to read and then and, um, see what other stories come out. Yeah, so this is actually, um, Antoinette, this is what you were pointing to a few minutes ago, and it, uh, um, it's about half, uh, halfway through the book, I guess, but um, it's, the section is entitled How to Really Listen for an Emergent Agenda. Uh, many years ago, I was working with a leadership team who had been trying to define common goals, things that they could be in alignment on rather than separated or divided by. And their presenting agenda, so sort of the thing that they show up with, uh, was that they wanted more alignment and to be a team. So far, so good. In fact, their goal was highly aligned with my own beliefs about what makes leadership teams effective. That's a cue. <laughs> Having alignment around shared goals and functioning as a team. And since it came from them, it was their agenda. Great. But my love for their agenda clouded my vision of the reality clouded my vision to the reality of what was playing out in their conversations every time they began to talk about a topic on the table. 
During a two-day offsite, the team got really bogged down in their conversation and just seemed to be going nowhere. Every facilitation move I made just created more directionless spin. There was deep resistance, yet I kept pushing the conversation forward. After a while, we took a break, and I remember feeling so frustrated by not being able to figure out what was wrong. I was frustrated by the lack of progress the group was making and was even becoming ambivalent about my work with them. I felt like I was letting them down and failing as a facilitator. Why was it so difficult to come around to a decision? And then it hit me. I was holding tightly to their presenting agenda and sneakily it had become my agenda too. But if I really listened to their conversation, I could hear that they did not actually want to be aligned around common goals. The words they used, the resistance to moving to closure on a decision, and the constant swirl in their conversations, these were all hallmark, hallmark, hallmarks of an emerging agenda. When we reconvened after the break, I stated what I was seeing. I said, you've been talking about this topic for some time now. I hear you repeatedly articulating that you want to align around common goals, but what plays out in your conversations is the opposite. You resist the idea. I've come to believe that I want alignment for you more than you want it for yourselves. And that's not a good place to be. I can't want it more than you do. Uh, we went on just to sort of wrap that up. Um, instead, we had a conversation about what it was like for them to want something in principle, but in practice feel unwilling to let go of the way they were currently working. So we decided to park the topic of alignment for a later date, agreeing that they were not collectively ready for it. The tension was named. Uh, the group made an intentional decision that created a huge sense of relief for them, both them and for me. And we were no longer fighting the resistance. Wow, thank you, Marcia. That's, that's wonderful. Um, that, that's, that's a good story. And Antoinette, when you were referring to that before, um, that's something that you have, that, that you um, struggled with yourself or that you've seen, you've been in that situation and you recognize that? Well, I've been in that situation and I've been in several others as well. It depends, <laughs> depends on how many war stories you want to hear. <laughs> well, let's give us one. Let's give us one. We'd love to hear one. So, so I suppose um, one of the earliest ones when I was thinking about um, our conversation this evening, one of the earliest ones that came to mind for me was when after an hour and a half, the scheduled time we had for a retrospective, we still hadn't gotten to a conclusion and we carried on for another hour and a half in exasperation. I eventually said to somebody, well, maybe it's because everybody knows that you never do what you take on. This was as the facilitator people, <laughs> as the facilitator. <laughs> 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 so, so that didn't have much fallout, um, and you know, and obviously, I really, I, I really um, had to think about what what triggered me to the point that I lost my neutrality to the to that point, you know, where um, where I said that, and you know, there was yeah, there there was um, no big fallout, but in a, in a similar incident. Um, about a year afterwards, at least I managed to hold my cool when something similar um, happened and and asked for a break, you know, so that I could just go and compose myself. <laughs> so, but yeah, so it's uh, for me, the journey, the journey to becoming a good facilitator has been one of self mastery. Mm -hmm. um, working yeah, with thank my you for sharing. Um, anybody else want to share a story? Well, I, I think where Antoinette is pointing is, and, and it builds on what I was hearing in Marcia's excerpt and some of the things other people are saying, two of the skills that I think really personify my journey are, are interwoven in the book, and that's around self-awareness and self-management, right? And and these are facilitation skills that, that when, you know, Yes, we need to be neutral as facilitators and things can happen that are going to trigger whatever in us, right? We're going to find ourselves back in that heightened state of anxiety or frustration or, or whatever. Um, and when we can invite the pause, as Antoinette said, either internally and, or sometimes externally, then we can really become aware of like, who am I in this and what's coming up for me? 
and it allows us to then lean into self-managing you know emotions attitudes and then behaviors and and it's funny marcia and i were texting a little bit about this last night around well what is self-management and 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 what does it apply to? And so for me, my facilitation journey, I've been able to bring this into you know, my life. As the mother of four daughters, there's a great amount of self-management going on with me all the time. Um, but it's, but it's, so it's, you know, our facilitation journey, we get to bring that into our lives to build on Antoinette's, you know, everything is about facilitation. It does feel that way. Um, so, so there's this self mastery that comes with practicing self awareness and self management, and I love how that's interwoven in the book. Mm -hmm. Wow! Thank you, Carrie. I have four kids too. I just don't have four daughters. <laughs> <laughs> are they all teenagers? <laughs> oh, mine are a little older. Um, anybody else, David or William or um, Larissa? Anybody want to share? Um, a personal story? I, I guess what I, I remember when I um, first started facilitating, I was partnered up with someone who was quite my senior in the, in the area. And he, and he said to me, if you ever get really stuck, just like throw it to me and I'll, I'll get us out of this. You know, and that, that standing in the storm thing um, that happens. And um, which happens um, to all facilitators at some point or another. And um, I realized um, it, was, it was a few years later, I was teamed up with someone else. And, um, and I said those very words to, to her um, and realized that I had been on a journey. I didn't exactly <laughs> know like when I, when I made that switch, but um, I felt very comfortable with that, that, you know, you could just like pitch it my way and mm. we'd be fine. Gosh, it's great to be in the room with someone who's got your back. That's, that's great. Well, I'm, and that's a great topic of conversation with Team Catapult faculty, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I think that's a hallmark of um, my experience with everybody here. Mm. That's excellent. Well, we're almost ready to turn it over um, to questions um, that have come in. Uh, anybody want to uh, finish up with, with this topic about um, stories that, you know, something good that, that, that happened with facilitation or a personal share? So one thing that I would say is um, that uh, Marsha flipped it for me, and I think that the book helps also uh, high, enhance that, is that uh, facilitation is about leadership. And uh, a lot of times, like I, even I had this bias early in my career of, you know, I'm not a note taker, right? That's exactly what I would think whenever people ask me to facilitate a meeting. I'm like, I'm not a note taker. Why am I going to do this? You know, if you want someone to note take, get the trainee or whoever, right? Um, and I think that what I didn't realize in working with Marsha, working with Team Catapult, and, you know, in the book, you can see that very clearly, is that uh, all the qualities we have been talking here, right, self-management, self-awareness, courage, saying no, all those qualities are great qualities of a great leader. And, and, and uh, so the, the it, facilitation is much more than you know, thinking about a design for a meeting and writing an agenda and inviting the right people in. It is about standing up in front of a room, working together with the people in the room and being a leader to them to get to the best outcome uh, uh, throughout that process. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for um, answering all these questions. I just um, looked at some of the questions that have come in uh, from our uh, viewers that are here. And the first one I wanna ask you, and anybody can jump in if they have an answer, but um, I think this is a very timely question. What will we've just been through with 2020? Uh, what is the major challenge between online versus in-person facilitation? I think we can probably spend a whole hour on this, <laughs> um, but if anybody wants to um, kind of give their 
um, you know, very short version of, of a challenge that you might have had. And I know for those of you that are watching, uh, we have an article on that on the blog. So there is um, an answer if you want to come to teamcatapult.com. And, uh, you know, you can see um, Marsha's uh, stand on that Team Catapult. But um, let's, let's give people an answer today. Before we do that, may I just ask a clarifying question? Yeah. What is what is in person facilitation? <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been that long. <laughs> I, I, I've heard about that. <laughs> I think I think um, coming up with the challenges of virtual facilitation feels easy to me. Right? People don't turn their videos on. People don't talk. People don't this. People don't that. Where I would point you to is actually what are the opportunities that virtual facilitation gives us? And so, you know, um, imagine in the room you have 20 people, all of whom have sticky notes and Sharpies, and you're asking them to put things on a whiteboard and group them and everything. All 20 people can't do that. But when we're working virtually and we're facilitating and we're using a tool like, like Mural, suddenly we can have... Uh, uh, synchronous collaboration where anyone can touch a sticky and move it and anyone else can jump it and move it back and we're not crowded around a whiteboard. So so yes, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the challenges. I think that where I'd really point you to is what are the opportunities and that's one. I think there's a lot of opportunities for getting introverts um, voices into the room, uh, you know, increased opportunity for creative collaboration in virtual space. So I'm purposely not answering your question, but pointing, you, <laughs> pointing you in a different direction. That's okay. Thank you, Carrie. I have um, room for one more answer to the same question before I jump to the next. Anybody want to take it? Yeah, I almost want to say the once again, if you if you look at the book and you go, what what do you need to change in yourself to make the virtual facilitation easy or not an opportunity, not a challenge? Uh, the reason I'm saying that is that's the process I went through uh, a couple of years ago. Antoinette Corey and myself were trying to figure out, can we do this stuff online? How do we do that? Luckily, Team Catapult had a class. So we took it and you start doing it. You've got to get comfortable in front of your computer, the tools you use, and start thinking in that way. And all of a sudden it becomes, okay, now it's just another way that I can do it. I can either do it virtually or I can do it in person. It's not a, a or, it can become an and. But by the way, we all, we all three got extra monitors. <laughs> yes, yes we did. Very good, thank you. That's a, that's a great tip. So I'm gonna move on to the last question in the chat. I think this is a good one um, to, to end this with. Um, it, the question is, I know that the book is targeted to agile teams. But do you feel it is applicable beyond Agile teams and why? And I'm going to throw that to Marsha first, and then I'll let somebody else um, answer that as well. Mm. I, think Agile give, I think Agile has brought to the forefront, um, it's made the conversation of collaboration important, but I, it's certainly not just for Agile teams. I think that so much of what we do, it, um, whether you're pursuing agility or not, I think you'll find resonance with the stories um, of what's in the book. I think it's a leadership. I think you've heard it um, from everybody today in one form or fashion. I think it's leadership. Excellent. And I see everybody nodding. <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a great place to end this conversation right now. Um, I'm going to check in with Patty and Trish to see um, about the drawing. Marsha, if you want to take this um, opportunity to, um, you know, say thank, thank your uh, panelists here, your team, your faculty yeah. that are here. Um, they are absolutely wonderful. I've really uh, enjoyed this conversation today, everybody. Yeah, I have to. I'm, I just genuinely, it's, uh, we haven't, <laughs> We were saying as we were getting ready for today, we were um, back when the world used to travel about and meet in person. So uh, in just three weeks, we will, it'll be a year since we've been together for a retreat. Uh, and we were on the banks of the Pacific Ocean in San Diego um, a year ago. Uh, so I just miss you all, but we've been working together. 
uh, across the year. And if you don't know these individuals, you should. They're amazing, um, both in their facilitation and coaching. So, and it's a great group of people to work with. So thank you all. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I want to tell everybody what's happening next week. Um, this is only one of several book tour stops. Um, so next week, we're going to have a conversation with um, Evan Laybourne and Zuzi um, Shikova. And we're going to talk about creating a pathway to business agility through facilitation. So uh, if you um, registered for today, which I'm assuming if you're here live and you're still here and you're watching, you might have signed up. If not the same link that you did to come here today, you can go back and register for next week's conversation. Uh, we wanna keep this virtual book tour going. We, we as a team are super excited um, for that um, and that we can share this book, you know, in, in, even during a time like we've just gone through in the last year that we're able to um, share this book and this message with everybody. Um, we want to remind you that the book is available um, online right now. Um, there is uh, all kinds of information on the book tour site, um, artandscienceoffacilitation.com, uh, where you can order the book. Um, I'm still waiting to hear who the winners are. So I'll give that um, <laughs> I'll give that information to you in a second. What I'm going to do then, I'm going to throw out the last question to the panel. And this is kind of like a fast rapid and then I will give you who the winners are. If you are a winner, by the way, um, you'll get a signed copy from Marsha for the book. So if I call your name as a winner afterwards, make sure that you um, stay along here in chat and let Patty know your email address. So the last question, the wrap up question that I have from everybody is, if if you had to pick one, facilitating is more art or more science? Which one would you choose and why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody want to go first on this one? I'm okay with going first. All right, um, William. For me, it's definitely art. Um, of course, the facilitation is all about moving the energy in the room, um, where it needs to go, what needs to happen. Uh, and therefore, for me, it's all around the art. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. I, uh, I, I've, I, I agree with that. More art. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll stand for the science and say that in, in the book, and Marsha and I've talked about this many times, I'm very grateful for the framework because whenever I get lost, there's, you know, there are times when, um, you know, uh, things we don't anticipate occur. Uh, and I always have that framework to uh, sort of lean on and it's really <laughs> invaluable. So uh, yeah, so there's some science there and, and I encourage you to, to leverage it. Excellent. Before we, uh, I'm going to ask the other panelists, I'm going to just make sure that um, you know who the winners are. So we have um, a book, a signed copy will go to Michael Reed and John Reinhardt. If you want to um, chat, yay, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> if you want to chat with Patty and let Patty know um, your email address, we'll get that signed, uh, sent to you. Uh, congratulations again. So uh, Carrie, art or more art or more science? Uh, I'm not big on polarities. I don't think that there's a great distinction between the two. I'm happy to sit in both. <laughs> <laughs> it's a yes and, you know, uh, yes you know and. people, it's a yes and. He's a great facilitator, can you tell me? Well, I will invite opposition and say no more polarity because everyone has been sitting on the yes and. Uh, <laughs> And I, I think that uh, a lot of people feel that it has to do with art uh, because it's very abstract, but it's not. Like every, every action is so intentional in the way that you do it, in the way that you approach people, in the way that you do the exercise, in the way that you explain the instructions, everything is, is, is very precise. It's like chemistry. You can't just go about making that without actually having the precise measures. Uh, so to me, it's more science. All right, Antoinette? So I would say it's a smart art. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, I we are at the top of the hour, everybody. I want to thank those of you who've um, stayed here the whole hour to listen to stories of facilitation. We thank you for being here and making this first stop of the virtual book tour for the art and science of facilitation um, a grand success. Um, I had lots of fun. The chat was buzzing with people saying that they loved it. There were some incredible questions, uh, great stories. I want to remind you that the book um, is available um, in paperback or electronically. Um, you can buy it on Kindle, on Amazon.com, um, and at Barnes & Noble. Um, all the questions you have about the book, there's lots of links that I think Patty has left for everybody, but it's um, artandscienceoffacilitation.com. And um, come back next week where we'll have another conversation, this time about creating a pathway to business, uh, business agility through facilitation. Uh, thank you again, panelists. Thank you, Antoinette, Larissa, Jeff, and Carrie, um, William, David, and Marsha. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here and being here live with us and supporting Marsha and her book. And uh, we are going to hopefully see you next week. Come back. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.